Hi, my name is Scott Stern. I'm a professor at MIT Sloan. My apologies for not uh, having the appropriate Ready 23 uh, <laughs> Zoom background, um, but I'm really looking forward uh, to a great, uh, um, a, a great uh, uh, discussion uh, this afternoon with Kurt Shearer and Bill Clarico. And before we get started, we'll, uh, uh, perhaps Kurt and Bill, can you just introduce yourself? And basically what we're gonna do is really be focusing uh, this afternoon on really how we invest and the kind of criterion for investment and building out startups in broadly um, emergency response and more broadly public infrastructure space. So maybe uh, Bill, and uh, why don't we start with Bill? Sure. Well, thanks, Scott. It's uh, it's great to be here. Uh, my name is Bill Clerico. I um, started my career as a CEO and founder of a fintech company. So we were a payments company called WePay. Uh, started in 2008. Uh, built that up over about 10 years. Sold it to J.P. Morgan Chase, um, and then uh, spent a couple of years at J.P. Morgan. And then leaving J.P. Morgan, I knew I wanted to be an investor. I cared deeply about climate. Um, and I had a wildfire affect our family property and um, sort of opened my eyes to an aspect of climate that climate change that was in my literally in my backyard. Um, and the more I learned about wildfire, uh, the more I got interested in it and concerned about it. And the more I believed that um, technology can make a big impact on it. And so I now I'm the uh, founder of a venture capital firm called Convective Capital, and we invest in technology companies that can impact the wildfire crisis, um, which obviously touches public safety in a number of, uh, of really important ways. Um, we're a $35 million fund. We invest at the earliest stages of company formation, um, and we're based in San Francisco. Great. Thank you so much. And Kurt? Great. Thanks a lot, Scott. Uh, my name is Kurt Scher. I'm a managing partner at a specialist venture capital firm called C5 Capital. I have the privilege of, of waking up every day and, and looking for the right leaders and technologies to preserve our way of life. Um, public safety is something I've been focused on for my whole career. I started out as, as a Marine. Um, and then as I'm in the, I can remember looking at technology involved in public safety in the months and years following 9-11, everything from uh, interoperability of radios between first responders to uh, the fragmentation of the homeland security market and what that matters, what what that meant. And uh, 20 years later, we have evolved, and I know we're going to talk about this today. But but some of the problems still exist. The the technology has gotten better, and the solutions are are needed now more than ever. So looking forward to our discussion. Yeah, that's 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 a, just a fantastic place to start, Kurt. And let's let's in fact start with you. I, I think you've both uh, laid out where you're coming from, and as well, what we're interested in is this kind of broad, both uh, challenge and the opportunities public uh, in emergency response in particular, but I think in that kind of broad public infrastructure uh, space that you just talked about. Um, so we know there are challenges to venture investing in public sector facing companies and defense security space. Despite that C5 capital premises, right, you are, as you said, you wake up every day trying to do this, um, which given the challenges, what do you think are the main hurdles that investors face? And Great, the, thanks, sort of thanks, detail so, come, yeah. how have you, how has C5 positioned itself to address that? Got it. Uh, so as you mentioned, we look in, we look at cyber, we look at space and we look at energy. And a lot of this touches different aspects of the of the public, public safety market. Um, I'd like to just briefly talk about three hurdles, and I'll call them the recognition hurdle, the understanding hurdle, and the communication hurdle. So first on the recognition hurdle, what what where a lot of people, where the challenge fit, fits, uh, or where people face the challenge is the understanding and the, the, the speed at which we have, the, we have to have the ability to recognize the dual use nature of many technologies. So whether that's uh, you know, because of the increase in computing power, the decreased cost of storage, increased bandwidth, many things have have the ability to do things at the edge. And and you know, we, we know this idea around smart cities, which is only uh, it's about a decade old or so. But just this idea of being able to do more at the edge, whether it's a sensor, whether it's an algorithm, whether it's a battery, whether it's a data stream, all of those affect solutions in public safety. 
and they also have other uses in government and commercial. And so what's great about being an entrepreneur or a founder or an investor at this point is the fact that you can look at one type of technology and have multiple markets that it can apply to. And so that obviously increases your TAM and increases the chance yep. of success. Second hurdle is, is the understanding hurdle. And that's once you now, so if you're if you're a commercial entrepreneur, maybe you've never done anything with the government or public safety, whether it's at the federal or state level, understanding the innovation mechanisms that exist in the federal government or at a state level government is, is challenging. It's not intuitive. Um, I can remember seeing the first Amazon packages in Afghanistan. And this idea that, you know, you could, you could get a commercial company to deliver something and to work across that barrier. And, and for the longest time, it was so hard for any small company to engage with, with the government. Then we went through a period because we're now all carrying these magic rectangles in our pocket and we have the internet and this, this idea that you can communicate across people that you have never met before. I mean, we're all so used to that now, but that's, that's really 15 years ago, right? And so then there was too much, too much engagement with the federal government and 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 the and the pitches that were out there. So we've now gone through 20 years of that, and and there are now specific mechanisms for how you get an idea to a government decision maker, but they're still not as intuitive as they should be. So understanding those innovation mechanisms and how to bring a product to bear in the right way is, is a second hurdle. And then the third hurdle is once once you understand the dual use technologies and now you have a way to 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 get it through a process, it's being able to speak speak that the right language. Um, in in 2014, I was hosting a, a, a an event where we had energy so small company founders in the energy market on one side of the table and DOE executives on the other side of the table, and we met for an hour and and I don't think in that 60 minutes, either side fully understood the incentives and the language that was needed to have a, a productive conversation. Again, we've gotten better. People are more used to this. The processes are more well-worn by the decades of entrepreneurs that have come recently, but you still have to have an understanding of that maturity. You have to be able to look at it from the other side. You have to understand the customer, whether that's the decision maker or, or the buyer, and be able to to speak their language. So, the dual use side, the innovation mechanism, and the communication, I think, would be three hurdles to approach. Yeah, From a C five standpoint, for the second part of your yeah. question, we really focus and 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 pride ourselves on understanding that value is created at the intersections of things. So that could be intersections between commercial and government. It could be intersections between the U.S. and our allies. It could be among states as they're making decisions, certainly among different stakeholders and definitely around technology. So, so value is always going to be at the seams of different disciplines or different groups and different people. And we try to bridge those, those lines. Yeah. Um, I'm going to just, I, I loved a lot of what you said there and we'll kind of turn to Bill in just a, just a second. But one thing I think is so interesting is, you know, of course, entrepreneurs, no matter where you are, right, need to understand the customer. But what's so interesting about what you said is very often when customers government, I'm sure that may not be the only customer. That's right. By getting the inside that mind and particularly the multiple layers of government, um, you know, much to appreciate there. But I thought that was really, really important. Bill, um, your angel invest angel and venture investing is in provide you said it well at the beginning. You're focused on the wildfire space that obviously reads into policymakers, firefighters, utilities, stakeholders. You're passionate, but beyond the passion, how are you overcoming maybe, or what are you looking for at that earliest stages in terms of the outline of in terms of the challenges outlined by Kurt? And how do you approach investing in this space? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I think um, there's so much opportunity for technology to have a, a positive impact on wildfire and, and public safety. And, um, you know, I think we have the privilege of talking to hundreds of founders and entrepreneurs that want to build some of that technology for, for our first responders. Um, 
I think the real challenge as an investor is finding which of those ideas are not just good ideas, uh, but can be good businesses and sort of the pursuit of that idea. And um, I think, you know, that, that really connects to something that, that Kurt said, which is, you know, figuring out um, where do sort of budgets live in these agencies? Who are the other customers outside of government that could also purchase a product so that you can really build a, um, you know, not just a, a product, but a business that can sort of, you know, help scale that product. I think a great example of this is um, one of our portfolio companies is a, a company called BurnBot. And so what BurnBot does is they build machinery and robotics to do fuel treatment, which is a, a really important way to yep. mitigate wildfire risk, you know, removing vegetation and, and doing prescribed burning. Um, they, you know, they certainly sell that as a service to the, to the federal government. They have contracts with the U.S. Forest Service, um, but they also have contracts with utilities and with private landowners. And so sort of having that portfolio of customers you know, that can move at different speeds and at different scale, you know, lets them sort of manage their business and manage the long contracting cycles that might happen with a, a government contract where, you know, they might sign an enormous contract to do, you know, treatment at a huge scale with the, with the federal government, um, but they can sort of layer in other smaller, more nimbler contracts with private landowners to sort of help grow quickly and, and scale their business. And I think the best entrepreneurs that we see are able to take that idea or that transformative technology and sort of bundle it with a business that can sort of navigate some of these challenges. And I think government can be a great partner and a great customer for these companies, um, but you know it works a certain way and at a certain speed and at a certain scale um, that that may not always work for a small startup trying to get their first contract. And so um, you know a big part of what we do is try to help founders think about broad customer bases and, and so they can demonstrate commercial traction and, and momentum. Um, in advance of uh, of landing that, that that really big contract. Kurt, let, let me come back to you, maybe just kind of building on Bill, right? Because I do think there's this kind of inevitable tension between that focused, repeatable sales process, maybe with multiple government customers, but all the same, versus the kind of almost kind of assembly approach that I think Bill was outlining. Kind of as you, as you think about that, you know, cut, cut, just maybe even just comment prompted by what, by, by that piece or, or whatever you'd like, um, as it relates. Yeah, to no, that. I agree. I mean, I, I agree with that. I think, um, I think there is, there is some standardization and there is some, you know, uniqueness that needs to come out of that. I mean, I think it gets to, um, understanding a little bit about what, what we look for in, in entrepreneurs and, and their ability to, um, understand both of those sides. Um, Yep. Would it be helpful to talk about some of those things? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, yeah. I, I, yeah, yeah. So, so let me actually start with Bill on this one, if that's okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but, yeah. I mean, in some sense, I think that there's a kind of nice linkage here between obviously you you both really started to focus on, and I, I love how Bill said it. There are a lot of good ideas out there and really valuable things in this space. The number of things that are going to be viable businesses is a subset of that. Right. But beyond that, the role of the founding team is critical for investors. What are you looking as you consider early stage, reasonably early stage investment in this space on the founder and team side? And let me, if it's okay, I'll start with Bill and then we'll come back onto you. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, ultimately what, what we look for is uh, maybe just zooming, taking a step back. Starting a company and building it to meaningful scale is really hard. You know, it's a, you know, the odds are stacked against you in, all kinds of different ways, um, and and you know the the you know when you when you incorporate a company, you've got a couple documents and a signature and a couple people sitting around a table, and you've got to go from that to a real business at real scale, and, and that's um, that takes an extraordinary person and team to 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 go do that. So I think ultimately what what we look for are exceptional people who are wake up every day and think about the mission to build something substantial and they, they're thinking about it in the shower they're, it's a it, it's core to who they are and they um it's not a job it's a it, you know it's a it's a it's a calling in, in some ways um we look for people that are, are really curious um that you know there's so much to be learned about these new businesses and spaces you know sort of by definition you're inventing something new and you're learning about a new customer problem and iterating on that quickly. And so sort of curiosity and, and the humility that comes with curiosity, I think is a really um, important trait. 
Um, then we just sort of look for ability. You know, does the does this person have um, the skill set, the experience, the technical skills, the customer relationships or insights um, uh, to go pursue this? And, and usually, we find that people that have all those characteristics are usually working on something pretty interesting. Uh, and, and so, um, but, but we we spent a lot of time trying to find the exceptional people that are going to build the exceptional companies because. Um, uh, it's it's a it's a hard it's a hard thing starting from zero. Yeah. And I, I just think there's a lot to that. I, I, I love the way you kind of broke it down. Mission, sure, you know the the curi the humility that comes with curiosity, kind of a learning, right? Which kind of sometimes gets in the way of mission. You know what I'm saying, right? Yeah. So sometimes people have to grow into that, and then sort of the skill set, mindset, ability side of things. And once again, people can grow into those roles, but sometimes, right, that's something you have to kind of, Kurt, how, you know, you're a little bit occasionally later stage than this, kind of, but, but also do their early stage as well. How are you thinking about this? Kind of what are you looking in, particularly, how about maybe even more at the team level as well? It, well it's like you're looking at my list here, Scott. Yeah. And, and and Bill, I love how you started with that. And and for the entrepreneurs in the audience it in or, or for the investors, uh, particularly at the early stage, it is even more about assessing the, the, the leader in the team as it is the business. And so I love the list that Bill started with. Um, I had I had mission and I had mission written down. I had humility written down. Um, but I'm going to pick up a different aspect of humility than curiosity, um, really around recognition of the competition. Uh, and and um, I can tell pretty quickly when. You know, if, if somebody comes and says, this is the only solution that exists in the market, we have no competition, um, the, there's a, that's a, a, an immediate red flag, right? Because um, even if you're pursuing latent demand, understanding who might, who is working even adjacent to you and having, having a healthy bit of, um, I'll say paranoia, but, but it's really a sense of urgency in terms of penetrating the market and getting your product in place, uh, that that's a that's a different aspect of humility, which I think complements bills pretty well. The other team aspect or, or person aspect I'll mention is the team, Scott, which you alluded to, and it's always encouraging when we see and it, maybe not on the first or second meeting, but an entrepreneur or leader that brings in his or her team um, and helps to um, demonstrate their participation and their contribution to what is being built, I think is really, really important. And that's a, that's a good, um, it's a good check against ego and, and another good check of, of humility. I'll mention um, two others. One is product market fit. And so that's one from a, from a business standpoint, that is, is the most important thing. Um, it's, you could be the greatest entrepreneur in the world and, and have all the passion, curiosity, humility, and ability but if you don't have something that you can sell in the marketplace and you understand who the decision maker is and at what price or point they're willing to buy and what problem you're solving, that's the most important thing. And all of that has to be done with some level of, of market research or engagement with potential customers and using that to drive your pitch and your product. Um, the, the chances of you succeeding are, are pretty low, or at least getting outside yeah. capital are pretty low. Uh, and the other one, it, it ties in with a little bit with the humility side is is competitive advantage. What? Why is your product better? Why is it? Why is it singularly better? And can you describe that succinctly and simply in a way that would cause someone to make a different decision about buying your product or solution than than what they're currently using or could pick at the place? Yeah, I, I mean, if it's okay, I mean, let's just kind of just build on that. If it's okay, I'll. I'll follow on with you, Kurt, is, you know, right, so there's the idea and broad market, there's the team, and then there's people showing up in your offices or on Zoom calls or whatever it might be doing pitch. And I think you already started to hint at some of this, but sort of kind of at the mechanics of what are you looking for, maybe even tactically, right? We have a lot of entrepreneurs in the group uh, today here we're probably very interested in this kind of what are you kind of what do you look for to get that initial meeting 
to give people the opportunity to pitch you in an in-person meeting. Um, and maybe even as well, bonus points, if you also can say, don't do this. You know, if there's some things that you see that people are always doing that may be a misconception or one thing I liked that you already said was, um, as my colleague Aaron Scott often says, the best way to ensure that you get no competition is to um, build a product or service that no one wants or uses. Um, then, then you never, you'll never get competition for that. But, but after that, the people will be there's always competition. So, um, so, so, Kurt, let me let me throw it back to you. Yeah, Things that's really well put. To get into that meeting, yeah. Yeah, it's really well put. I think, and from a very tactical level, right? There, there's only there's only six or seven things, right? So. Number one, what's the problem you're trying to solve? So someone that can articulate this quickly in a, in a very short email or in, in the first 60 seconds of, of a conversation, right? What's the problem you're solving? What's the solution that you're bringing? What's your understanding of the market, market size, market context? What's your competitive advantage? Which again, some of these things we've talked about. What's your short-term plan and how much do you, in this case, from a capital standpoint, how much capital do you need to accomplish that plan? Uh, well, it really the plan, I'll, I'll separate the capital out. So the plan, the team, and then the ask. So problem, solution, market, competitive advantage, plan, team, ask. So those are kind of the seven, the big seven, super I, seven. I wish I, 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 wish I, I, wish I could write, write, it, write things down more quickly, put them into the chat for everyone, but that's it, right? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's it. a really nice, Right. And the point is, you have to get really good. And just because you've said it 100 times as the founder doesn't mean that the 101st person has ever heard about this. That's it's right. Like really important just to be practiced, like like a very and I think you said it very well. And I think that what happens is that that then the qualities that you're looking for are in some sense instantiated through the ability of a leader, an entrepreneurial leader to really nail what you just said. Bill, yeah. What th thoughts and comments? Yeah, I, I would definitely agree with what Kurt said. I think that's sort of the element of a, of a great pitch. I would say the 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 two things I really like to hone in on, you know, aside from the founder, is um, what's the unique insight they have about the gap in the market and the solution that's required by customers, and you know how 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 real is that insight um, and, and you know, is it a, I had this idea, you know, I was sitting in my dorm room and I came up with this idea or is it, hey, I've talked to 300 practitioners and I've heard, this is exactly what I've heard and I've worked there every summer and I, you know, or like where, what's the sort of quality of that insight? Um, and then to sort of back that up, it's what is the, what is the proof point from an actual customer that exists? And it could be, you know, if it's a brand new idea, it could just be, hey, here's 30 customers you can go talk to who will validate this insight. Uh, it could be, hey, here's our sales pipeline and, and here's you know all the quality conversations we're having. Ideally, it's here's all the revenue we have and uh, you know here's what's actually sort of coming in the door. Um, but I, I think there's a lot of, you know, a lot of the pitch is somewhat formulaic, like, and you have to have a really thoughtful plan the whole way through. But in my experience, those are the two hardest. Like, if you can actually come up with a unique customer insight and actually have proof points that that insight is unique and valuable, the best companies really can answer those questions. I, I mean, I will say because you know, I, you, you guys, I'll send it along to you. But you know, when Michael um, and Nick were building out Rapid SOS, our our host for this meeting, you know, we wrote a case on them very early using some of the tools that uh, you know around some of the tools we were building um, at MIT, and. I remember, you know, Michael, you know, it was some sort of random email and it was like, oh, I'm going to, you know, revolutionize emergency response. And I was a little bit like, that sounds great guy. Um, he's like, I have a private equity background. I was like, who knows? But then when I met with him and he explained to me that he had taken his dad's Prius and visited 250 public safety answering points over the course of a summer. And then I pushed him on that. And all of a sudden it was clear that this was not just some in the shower, why don't we solve the problem? He was the world's leading expert at that point, basically, in what was the day-to-day -day reality of emergency response at the, P at the PSAP level across the country in terms of lived experience of the challenge of dealing with mobile response. 
and it, it's a teaching point that we use today. I just taught it last week and it, it, it kind of resonates. It's like, have you done that? And I love what you said, Bill. It's having that well-formulated, you know, not easily right, dismissed idea of what was missing in the marketplace in the market. Um, which goes it back sounds to, easy, but it actually requires a lot of it's courage. It's a really like, hard to go thing. But once you get yeah. it, it, right, my sense is that you're, and, and so what you're hearing, right, I'm a, you know, I love building, you know, helping, you know, founders build. But you're saying from the investing side that that, that having a founder appear before you who kind of is able to make that articulation within the context of the first list, that's a differentiator for you to, to at least continue the conversation. 100%. Yeah. And, and the way, sometimes the way we talk about it is an entrepreneur that can get to simplicity on the far side of complexity, right? That may have the idea and it's got to be market back, not tech forward. That's gone through all the pain and complexity and, and 250 customers and then can crisply explain it simply and, and straightforwardly to get to that level. Okay. We're just about out of time. And um, I think what we're going to do is, is I'm just going to kind of fold in your parting thoughts on this. So first, I want to thank both of you. And I also want to thank Rapid SOS and the whole 23 team uh, for, you know, really what I find very stimulating conversation. But why don't I kind of throw back you last thoughts, in particular with an eye towards, you know, we live in a changing world uh, from text moving fast. We exist in this world where we're just coming out of, in some sense, we're still coming out of the pandemic period. On the other hand, we right, as investors, we now live in a world back of high interest rates or higher interest rates. Um, just in this last minute or two, what are you looking for in the future? Where do you think things are going and any other parting thoughts you have? If it's okay, I'll start with Bill and then we'll finish up with Kurt. Yeah, um, Kurt and I were talking about this a little bit before we came on the panel, but you know, the, the world, is increasingly interconnected and also increasingly unstable. You know, I, I think um, you've got climate change driving instability. You've got geopolitical tensions. You know, you've got the ability of things like social media that connect large numbers of people that can, you know, do things in sort of less and less stable ways. And so, you know, a big part of our thesis is that, you know, it, as the world sort of heads in that direction, tools that can help us manage that instability, um, whether it's, you know, climate instability or, or other forms of resilience, um, I think are, are hugely important. And so, um, you know, that's our, uh, a big part of our thesis at Connected is how do we build tools to help us adapt to a, to a, a changing world? Um, and, and I think those tools are, are very important. Great. Very yeah, I would add just, we continue, we're on the incremental changes of faster, great, you know, faster, smaller, cheaper, and there will continue to be um, improvements made in, in sensors and video and audio and, and interconnectivity and, and analytics. The, the big changes and where the, the chance for entrepreneurs to make the greatest impact, though, is understanding how those things affect humans. And that, that human interface is going to be increasingly important Yes, we need the right algos. Yes, we need the data. Yes, we need all that stuff. But thinking about how people are going to get a so what out of that and create value among human beings is is the greatest value. Yeah, I, I think I think that's a really good note to end on. It actually comes right back to the comment you made at the beginning, which is you know at some fundamental level the tech is there in many cases. In there, so right, but in this space it seems there's a big gap between what's technically feasible what's a good idea and what ultimately you can actually create value for that you can build a business around at a practical level. And I think some of that thinking through the lens of the customer, even if that customer is government, you know, to really understanding that, thinking back through the lens of the humility that Bill talked about that, like, I, I just love that phrase. I thought it was a good connection that with curiosity leads to humility is I think a really nice insight. And then ultimately, you have to be able to distill that down into a pitch, into a sort of team formation that really will kind of the ethos that really can deliver, that lets people understand that. And so to get that meeting with you guys. And then you can go into the details as you continue those meetings and you start to really dig in. 
and really make sure that the technology is there, the team is there, and ultimately that product market fit that you both talked about. Listen, um, I think we are two minutes over time and I'm sensitive that there's lots else going on. Uh, thank you so much. My apologies that my I was not able to get quite the ready 23 background. I'm, I, I, I somehow flipped it around on my screen five times, couldn't quite make it work. Um, thank you guys so very, very much. And um, I really also want to thank uh, Rapid SOS and um, also ready 23 for what I think uh, uh, was really, really nice conversation. Talk to you guys yeah, later. Thanks so much. Thanks Bill, so thank much. You. Thanks everyone. Talk to you Keep later, pushing buddy. hard. Yep, absolutely. Okay. Keep this All going. Right. Great. Take Bye -bye. care.